All right, here we go. The final message of Revelation. We've been in the Revelation sermon series for, I think, 16 weeks, 16 sermons. Today, the 17th, kind of a wrap-up, an overview. I think this is important because we've spent now uh, many weeks in, in the second portion of this book, the very uh, the apocalyptic section, the 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 vision of heaven and and the earth in this dynamic tribulation setting, and I, and I want us to look back. Really, we're going to go back to the beginning and see the bookend, see the tie-in, see the themes. But let's start this morning. The, ser- the sermon is called simply "God is in control." I know that's mind blowing to many of you, um, but let me prove it this morning. Let's ask a few questions first. Uh, Maybe the first question, what is the setting of Revelation? The setting. And you may say, well, it was uh, the seven churches in Asia, so we're talking about the Roman Empire. Uh, Even bigger than that, I would say the setting of Revelation is this. It's the here and now, and it is also the yet to come. The here and now, and the yet to come. So as you read this book, I want to be thinking where are we at? Is this the here and now, what I'm experiencing now, or is this still the yet to come? And, and, and what is that? how does that help me both rest, trust, and prepare and hope? The here and now and the yet to come. The same was uh, true for the early church. As they read this, they said, there's the here and now in this, and there's still the yet to come. And it's the same for us today, the here and now and the yet to come. Uh, as I was preparing this, I asked myself, what's a, if I had to give a one-sentence summary of the main focus of the book of Revelation, what would that one-sentence summary be? And I, and I wrote this, Revelation is a book which unveils the life of Jesus Christ from his ascension into heaven following his earthly crucifixion and resurrection all the way to the consummation of his marriage and eternal kingdom here on earth. Revelation is a book which unveils the life of Christ from his ascension after his crucifixion and resurrection until his consummation of his marriage. Who does Jesus marry? The church, his bride, and the consummation of his eternal kingdom in a newly created earth. Revelation is a book in two parts. Part one, chapters one through three, Jesus speaks to his church. He speaks through John to the seven churches of Asia. Again, there are more than seven churches in Asia. So again, seven, that number of total completeness. The idea that this is a message to all the churches in all places, not only of that time, but all times. But he's going to look at seven distinct realities of his church. He's addressing the here and now in chapters 1 through 3. In part 2, chapters 4 through 22, Jesus begins to show the spiritual realities of the Father's plans and purposes, which are both here and now and yet to come. The, the, the vision of the throne room of heaven is a here and now reality. That's not going to happen. God is ruling and reigning. Not one day he's going to have that throne. He has that throne. It's here and now. Jesus is the Lamb. All these things have a both here and now and yet to come. And when we think of these things just as physical realities, we miss actually what's what's happening. These are deep spiritual truths that come to bear on physical realities. Revelation is a spiritual book of spiritual truths. That's why it uses apocalyptic language. If we think just physical, just literally physical, we're, we get distorted. And we miss the point on God's sovereignty, his reign, his rule, his authority, his ordaining plans. Okay, so let's look. Let's go back to chapter 1 now that we've, been back, that we've gone through the book and remind ourselves what he said at the beginning. Chapter 1. Verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is a book about a revealing or an unveiling. The Father reveals the Son. The Son gives his message to an angel. An angel gives his message to John. John delivers the message to the church. This book is about Jesus. He is the hero. 
He is the king. He is the focus. This book is not predominantly about Satan, about the beast, about chaos, or about the mark of the beast. This book is not about a rapture or an escape. In fact, this book isn't even about the kingdom of God or judgment. Those are not the focus. The focus and the center is Jesus. Through him, all other things in this book make their place, hold their bearings. If Jesus isn't at the very center of this book, you are wrong. There's my statement of truth today. If you think about the mark of the beast and Jesus isn't the center of that thought, you're wrong. You will be wrong. And this is why so many people, as they read Revelation, are led to things, feelings, emotions that are not rooted in Jesus. Think about it. When you've read Revelation before, how many of you experience fear, a little panic? A little worry, a little anxiety, a little, I don't understand, and so this is just madness. We, you, if you're rooted in Jesus, you cannot experience those things from his word. That is a distortion of his word. Unless you fear God, that'd be a good fear. But the fear of end times, the fear of, is not rooted in Christ. That means your, your interpretation is distorted. Christ is the center. And we, we don't want to be wrong. We don't want to be distorted. Why? We want to be right because righteousness is blessed in this book. To be right is to be rooted in righteousness. In fact, that leads me to uh, verse 3. Verse 3 says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Blessed. I think Pastor Sean mentioned it maybe last week. There are seven blessings in the book of Revelation. We call them the seven Beatitudes. You could do a sermon series just on that. Just as there's the seven churches, there's the seven blessings. And don't think that that's uh, just uh, by chance. Uh, I'm going to get to those at the very end. But let me show you the first two that are right here. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words, and blessed are those who hear and keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Blessed are those who read aloud the words of this prophecy. This book should be read often and out loud. It should be preached. It should be taught. It shouldn't just be brought up on Sunday nights with weird scrolls and charts and graphs. Anyone grew up in Sunday evening church in the 80s, 90s? And you experience a lot of revelation teaching. It's kind of hot back then. And uh, that's probably not the teaching that God is encouraging. Uh, we need to read it out loud, not, not read man's opinion about their, the time that Jesus is going to come back. This is why I hope you've been, been encouraged, is we've just let the text speak. Funny how, you know what word is not in the, in the book of Revelation? Antichrist. Do you know the word antichrist isn't in the book of Revelation? And yet, what's, what's Revelation about? The Antichrist and the mark of the beast. It's like, it's like beauty and the beast. Get the beast, get the beast. And, and it's, you know, sometimes uh, uh, rapture is never in the book of Revelation. That word does not appear. Interesting what we read into sometimes because of what we're trying to get out of. We want to read the text out loud because we want to let Jesus speak. Again, he's at the center. Not only are those blessed who read this out loud, but blessed are those who hear it. Maybe that's a reason why uh, we should join together on Sundays, to hear God's word spoken and preached. But again, it's not just hearing it, it's keeping it. It's not just in one ear and out the other, let's get to Sunday buffet, except those are still closed, right? So... We're still missing out on a portion of Sunday until the buffet is open. Then we can get back to normal, back to Sunday church. Keeping is observing, obeying, and acting in accordance. So that's why it's important whether you're here on Sunday hearing the preached word, whether you're reading the Bible in your morning disciplines, whether you're gathered together with your life group, working through the text. Just let me tell you, 
Your reading the text means little. You're holding on to its truths, believing in its promises, and acting out its calls to obedience. That is what matters. Because you can hear a lot of things, and they don't really have any bearing on your life. It is only in the acting, only in the believing, only in the actual observing and obeying that all of that hearing does anything. May we be faithful to respond to what we hear. Verse 4, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and was and who is to come. Here's this section, verse 4 and following about the triune God. Grace and peace from the triune God. Anyone need grace this morning? Praise be to God, here it is. If you ever like, is God still in the grace business? He says it over and over, grace and peace to you. Not only does he give you grace to cover your sins, for you to be able to confess and repent and walk anew in righteousness, he's at peace with you. That is the beauty of a Christian. This morning, it's not just that you're forgiven, it's that you're reconciled. Remember that. You're not forgiven so that you can, you can be free of the guilt and the shame alone. You're forgiven so that you can be in relationship with God Almighty at peace. What a beautiful truth that I think some of us neglect. It goes on, verse 5, the middle of 5. It says, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. Grace and peace from the triune God who, number one, loves us. Anyone need to hear that this morning? He loves you. Again, if you're a Christian, this is to Christians. Let's just make sure this isn't God loves the whole world. He's not writing this to the world. He's writing this to the seven churches, those he has saved. He loves you this morning. That's what it means to be in peace with God, to be reconciled, to experience His gift of grace. He loves you, and He's demonstrated that most powerfully by freeing us from our sins, the slavery and bondage and oppression of that reality. What's interesting now, just a side note, it's interesting how much um, you're, you're seeing a world, well, I shouldn't say a world because it's highly American and then highly European because they follow us in culture. It's interesting how right now everything is about victimhood. And I could preach a whole message, but I don't have time. But since it's my last Sunday for a while, let me just offend everyone. <laughs> I'm concerned. I'm concerned that our culture right now makes much of victimhood for two reasons. Number one, there are actual true victims in, in this world and in this nation uh, who are not getting um, the attention that they need, the care that they need, the help that they need. There are actual victims. And when everyone becomes a victim, then the actual victims don't get the need and the service and the help they, they, they get. The second thing is this. No one, when you're in a victim, it's one thing to be a victim of something and to experience healing and, and the ability to, to overcome that situation. But when you're a victim and you're in a victim mindset, you will do nothing purposeful with your life. If you stay in the, in the, in the posture and the mindset of victimhood, you will do nothing purposeful with your life because your life becomes so centered on you. And the problem with victim mindhood is this. If you have a victimhood mindset, then you will continue to find more sadness and more victimhood in your situation. Does that make sense? What happens is if you, if you become to root your identity in your victimhood, then you've got to make your victimhood bigger, which means you make, you, 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 it's like telling a fishing tale. Right? Have you ever been around, you know, uh, when you walk in maybe a dinner party, someone's saying a story and then the next person one-ups them? Well, I, I, you know, when, when I went fishing, it was this big. When I went fishing, the fish ate me. 
you know, and everything just keeps getting bigger. That's what happens just with hum, human existence because we just, we have this identity problem. We have to be better than each other. And in a victimhood society, that means your victim uh, situation has to become bigger and bigger until all of a sudden you're, you're not in real life anymore. This is why counselors right now have a massive problem. It's because people have, have created such a victimhood mentality that they, they believe. Uh, they, they don't even know what to believe anymore, but the problem is they believe a lie. They've so magnified their victimhood that they don't even know what's true anymore. And so a counselor is trying to wade through what... what it, 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 they're trying to wade, wade through what is even true. And again, hear me here. There are real victims. Some of you have experienced incredible, painful suffering. And God loves you. And God is here to walk with you and to bring healing. And he will bring ultimate healing on the day he sees you face to face. But let's be careful. Let's be careful when the world calls us to find a lot of oppression and a lot of victimhood and external things. Let's remember this. Everyone in this world is a sinner. Everyone in this world has the same internal bondage and oppression, and it's called sin. And it does the primary damage. It's why there's racism. You want to deal with racism? Deal with sin. You want to deal with any kind of ism? Deal with sin. Get off the social media, stop posting your dumb pictures, and do something about it. I said that to you online. Because some people online need to pay attention. Do you hear me this morning? It just bothers me when all we do is post stupidity on social media and think we've done something. The only way you will do anything is to love your neighbor. Interesting, where did I hear that before? And the only way you can love your neighbor is by loving Christ. Because if you try to love your neighbor only with your love, your love will run dry real quick. Because let me tell you something, your neighbor's a sinner. Your neighbor's annoying. Only when we are connected to the love of Christ can we love unconditionally as he loves us. That is the cure to racism. That is the cure to every ism. That is the way that we will one day live when we are connected to the root, face to face with Christ. And until then, let us practice. Grace and peace from him who loves us and has freed us from our sins. And how? Did he, did he wave his magic Harry Potter wand? Did he, did, he, did he have an epic lightsaber battle with the Dark Lord? No, he freed us by the blood of Jesus. This is the gospel. that The Son of God became man. He incarnated into human existence, the very existence that he created and that he breathes life into and sustains. The incarnation of Christ, the life of Christ, a righteous life that should have led him to become the ruler of the world. Everyone should have seen his goodness and his power and said, put him on the throne. And instead they put him on a cross and crucified him so that he would be the once and for all perfect sacrifice so that through the shedding of his blood, we might become cleansed. The reason you are white as snow, pure before Christ, is because his blood covers you. It's the craziest image ever. Anyone ever had blood get on a white shirt and you try to get that out? It's like, yeah, it ain't coming out. Even with the Pinterest secrets, it ain't coming out. And yet this blood makes you pure. Imagine, you know, I have a friend who did the whole, uh, what, do, what do they call it? The um, uh, crash the dress or mess the dress. You take your wedding dress and you go out like on an adventure and roll around the mud. Anyone heard about this? Am I the only one? What's it called? Trash the dress. There it is. Trash the dress. All right, whatever. See how bored we are today in America? I just don't get it. Uh, you, you would look at this image and think this is the ultimate trash the dress. So I'm going to put on my wedding dress and stand underneath a fountain of blood. Sounds pretty horrific. And yet... 
This is the picture that brings ultimate cleansing. Again, not your righteous works, not your good efforts, not your even good thoughts, but the blood of Christ is what frees us. And because he resurrects from death, conquering the ultimate consequence of death, and ascends, again returning to heaven to rule and reign as the king, immortal, he makes us a kingdom to live with him. And titles, priests, to serve him in it. This is a past, present, future statement. He loves us. Jesus showed that throughout the past. He has freed us from our sins, a past crucifixion reality, but a present we are being freed from our sins. Anyone here freed totally yet? Anyone have a perfect week yet? Sometimes I like to check in and see. Someone's seen Jesus face to face and we didn't know it. We're still in the, we're working out our salvation with fear and trembling as God works within us to bring transformation and holiness and righteousness. And here's a future. He is making us a kingdom and we will be priests in it. If you ever want to know what the past, present, future looks like, look right there. Verse 5 continues. Or verse 7 actually. Behold! He is coming with the clouds and every eye will see them, even those who pierced Him. Behold, remember this is the, this is the look up here! Steve Martin on top of the shed. Three amigos. This is important. And what does He say? Behold, this is important. He is coming. Does that sound familiar? It's the bookend of the entire book. Again, John is writing because Jesus is coming. We don't know when. And we today look and go, man, it's been a while, man. I wonder if God's clock is broke. But again, he's got a plan and a purpose. Our job isn't to question. Our job is to patiently endure and to wait with great expectation and eagerness for him to return. So the beginning of the book, behold, important, he is coming. At the end of the book, last chapter, what's it say three times? Behold, He is coming. Behold, He is coming. Surely, He is coming. Again, the center of the book is Jesus. Who is He? Jesus. Okay, are, are, we, are we okay this morning? Sometimes I think, did they just, is it like, sometimes I feel like I'm in a dream. Remember how you go into the sports stadiums and people bought cardboard cutouts of themselves and put them? It's like my greatest fear during COVID that I'm going to wake, that someone would actually do it. Remember when we were just recording and no one was here? I was like, please don't do the cardboard cutouts. <laughs> Sometimes I'm just questioning this morning. Jesus is coming. Jesus has come, incarnation and salvation. Jesus will come again, consummation of marriage and kingdom. Jesus has come and brought freedom. Write that down. There's your word. He has brought freedom. Jesus is coming. He is bringing fulfillment. Are you living in the freedom that you have been granted today? And are you looking towards the fulfillment that is coming? Or are you caught up with the things of this world? Is the predominant focus of your life you? When you're centered on Christ, you remember the freedom. You rest in the freedom. You trust in the freedom. Celebrate the freedom. And you look towards the fulfillment. Your life is set on a trajectory. And it's not the things of this world. It's the things above. It's the things that matter. It's the things you want the most. But do you believe that Christ can actually give them? Verse 9, I, John, your brother and partner. John is writing this book, and then he says two very important things. Your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom. He is our partner in the here and now, the tribulation the hardships, the suffering. But he's also a partner in the kingdom, the yet to come. John's mindset. This is the reality of our here and now, but remember what's to come. We're family in this. We are partners in this. And he is a co-laborer in the what? And the patient endurance that is in Jesus. Patient endurance is a major theme throughout this book. We see it over and over and over. John 
Many believe it's the Apostle John that writes this letter. If it's not easy for John, an apostle, who loved Jesus and was loved by Jesus, then none of us should expect it to be easy. Christian life is not easy. It's not easy, first and foremost, because you have a, a desire to sin. And so holiness will be at war with sin. It's also not easy because you live in a sinful world. That means temptation is going to be abundant. Culture is going to woo you and lure you. Every day is a fight, which is why it's a call for patient endurance. Endurance, so that we might run the race. Patience, that we might not sprint and die on the way. John is told then to write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches. And so then we get chapters 2 and 3, and remember the seven churches are the here and now. We get, we get a picture of their good things, we get a picture of their bad things, but Jesus sends every one of the letters to them with hope, to the one who conquers, to the one who remains rooted in what Christ has accomplished and rooted in the Spirit's empowerment, to the one who conquers. The big idea to these seven churches is this, repent of sin, walk in sanctification, patiently endure tribulation and suffering. So every one of those letters you can read and go, what do I need to repent of? Remember, the key isn't to go, what church are we? Because we already told you, you'll always choose Ephesus. There's a, there's a little wrong, but it's, it, you can kind of distort it and go, oh, it's not that bad. It's just, a, I'm not Laodicea. Yes, you are. Okay. The point is, what sin do we need to repent of today? Maybe yours is even listed here. The key is, we always need to be repenting. Because sin is always at the door. Repent of sin. But don't be satisfied with just repenting of sin, saying no. Say yes to something. Walk in sanctification. Walk in holiness. Walk in maturation. Too many Christians think, I didn't sin. I didn't, I didn't do, so I'm good. But the problem is, that's only one part of Christianity. Christianity is both, yes, what we say no to, but what we say yes to. Walking in life. Walking in hope. Walking in belief. Walking in maturation. Walking in the fruit of the Spirit. John is given this look around, chapters 2 and 3, at the here and now, the churches that he is familiar with. Then he gets the rest of the book as a look above, this heavenly vision. And I just remind you real quickly of the summary of that. There's the throne room, which is chapter 4, the power and sovereignty of God. God is, is displayed as holy and holy and holy. And then look at, look at chapter 4, verse 11. It says this, uh, the, the, the elders, right, cast their crowns before the throne, and they say this, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Worthy are you. Chapter 5, we get a picture of the Lamb, which is Jesus. He is crucified. He is arisen. He is ascended into glory. And, and they, we encounter this scroll that cannot be opened. But except it can be opened by only one, and that is by the Lamb. And for, chapter 5, verse 12 says this, saying with a loud voice, these are all the elders, all the multitude of angels. They say, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and Glory and blessing. Isn't that interesting? Chapter 4, they say, Worthy are you, our Lord and God. In chapter 5, they say, Worthy is the Lamb. John is making sure that people see Jesus is God. This is a triune God. Father, Son, and Spirit. Three persons, one God. Worthy is God. Even the Jews would agree with that. But worthy is also the Lamb. Jesus is worthy, and because he is worthy, the scroll is opened. And they open the scroll, and there and they're come out of it four apocalyptic scenes. The first scene is the seven seals. The second scene is the seven trumpets. The third scene is the woman and the dragon. And the fourth scene is the seven angels with seven plagues and seven bulls. The seven seals r reveals really, if, if you looked at that in its totality, it, it's, it's trying to get you a few, it's trying to help the church with a future hope. Because remember, what's the, what's the middle section of that? The middle section is about the sealed, those sealed in, in Christ, those, the multitude that will sing. In fact, if you look at uh, chapter 7, verse 13, 
and 14, it says this, Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. There it is again, this over this theme that you see over and over and over, the blood of the Lamb, cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. This tells us about our future hope. The seven trumpets tells us about our present witness. What's the interlude in the seven trumpets? The two witnesses. That we have a job to do. Our job isn't just to patiently endure under a rock. Our job is to patiently endure within the darkness. To be light in darkness. To be salt in a world that's decaying. To be witness. Again, what does a witness do? A witness simply speaks on what it has seen, what is it experienced, what it is known. You can't be a witness of Jesus Christ without experiencing. Have you experienced the gospel? Have you experienced salvation? Have you experienced transformation? The Christian life is experiential. It's not just knowledge. It is the knowing of the one. This gives us our present witness. Then the third, the woman and the dragon, Satan, Israel, the promised Messiah, kind of the retelling of the entire biblical story. This tells us about our present. It tells us about tribulation. There's a key theme in here. It says Satan was thrown down from heaven. And what does he do? It says he pursues the other children of the woman. This is the church. We have tribulation because Satan is in his death throes. He knows it's over. Christ is victorious, conquering sin. And so he will lash out and try to do all that he can to make humanity turn away from God, rebel against God, continue in its sinful situation. So again, it's not about the beast, empire of man, false religion of man. It's about Christ. It's about the Lamb and His followers. We see the three angels give a message, fear God, give Him glory. Message two, fallen is Babylon the great. Number three, worship the beast and you will drink the wrath of God, a warning. And this is where chapter 14, verse 12, something you should underline. Talking about this warning, right? If you worship the beast, if you can't serve two masters, Jesus says. And so, are you worshiping the empire of man? Or are you rooted in Jesus and the kingdom to come? Chapter 14, verse 12 says, Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Again, that's our job, is to root out the empire and those sinful desires, sinful comforts, sinful pleasures, sinful distortions in our life. That's how we endure. It goes on, the harvest, the winepress of God's wrath again, the seven angels with the seven bulls. The big thing about the seven angels and the seven bulls I want to highlight is how, how, does it, how is it finished? What does God say once the seventh bowl is poured out? He says, it is done. That means the story has an end. It is over. What happens at the end then? Judgment. The prostitute and the beast, culture and empire are judged. Rewards are given. Remember, reward isn't just a positive. It can be a negative. The two rewards are... Number one, the marriage supper of the Lamb, that bride is clothed in her beautiful dress, the church. There's the great supper of God. All those who desired to eat upon the luxuries of the empire of man will then eat upon their ruin. The reign of Christ is displayed. All of humanity is judged at the great white throne of judgment. For those names not found, they're thrown, cast into the lake of fire. Eternal judgment, again, do not believe that the lake of fire is a physical reality. Believe it is a picture, is a symbol. Lake, water is the picture of evil over and over and over in the Bible. Fire, can you imagine anything worse than ultimate evil on fire? Like again, it's a picture to help us know that's not where I want to be. The torment there is greater than a lake of fire. A lake of fire is not, the the, the idea of a place without the presence of God in grace. God will be there. God's everywhere. But no grace will be there. No comfort will be there. No peace will be there. Absolute man-centered anarchy. 
But for those who name, whose names are found, praise be to God, we get a whole chapter, chapter 21, to tell us about a new heaven and a new earth. What, what, what is known as the Garden City. Again, it's the Garden of Eden made into a city, made even more robust. These are the blessings that God has in store for His church, for His people who love Him and whom He loves first. Again, the blessings, the Beatitudes, let me run through them real quick. If you want to know them, you can write them down. Number one, we read it. Chapter one, verse three, those who read aloud. Number two, chapter one, verses three, those who hear and keep. Again, read the book, hear it, keep it, walk accordingly. The third one, chapter 14, verse 13, those who uh, blessed are those who are dead, who die in the Lord. Again, speaking to martyrdom, but it's also speaking to us all. When you die, I want to die in Christ because that, that's an affirmation of my salvation, affirmation of my hope. Are you in Christ today? Would you describe your relationship with Jesus in Christ? Or is he just kind of your buddy? Is he just the guy you kind of go to when life kind of starts to spin out of control? Are you in Christ, rooted in him? Is he the center of your life? The fourth beatitude, chapter 16, verse 15. Blessed is the one who stays awake, who stays alert, who who stays vigilant, who, who is not woke to the world, but asleep to Jesus. No, we are awake in Christ. What are you awake to this morning? What are you allowing percolate your attention? Number five, chapter 19, verse 19, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The one invitation you want. Better than, I don't know, I think I I saw on the news, is is there some award ceremony tonight? I don't know, Hollywood throws an award ceremony like every other week for themselves. That's it. Uh, So I'm sure there's some award ceremony tonight. But you know, everyone wants to go and they sit at the tables and they, ha, ha, ha drink their fancy wines with their pinkies out, right? If you got that invitation, you probably wouldn't turn it away. You'd be like, oh, man, ooh, might have to go check this out. Here's the invitation you want. Invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. May we live as people with an invitation. Number six, chapter 20, verse 16. Blessed are those who share in the first resurrection. That's the resurrection of the dead, that we would be resurrected. That death, this is the idea. Again, death is the ultimate consequence of sin. Praise be to God that there is a resurrection. The resurrection. That is the first resurrection. Praise be to God that for those who love Christ, who are centered in Christ, this life is not the end. We will be raised. And then, chapter 22, verse 7, it actually repeats... Number two, remember number two was chapter one, verse three. Blessed are those who hear and keep these words. Again, chapter 22, seven. Blessed are those who keep the words of this prophecy. It's important because it's a bookend. He's going to start out, read it, speak it, hear it, and keep it. And at the end, guess what? I'm saying it again. Keep it. And then the final beatitude, number seven, chapter 22, verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes. 22.40. Again, it says it again. There there are themes that just keep happening over and over and over. Number one, hear this book. Keep the commands and hold the promises of this book. Hear it and keep it. Well, who should keep it? Those who have washed their robes in the blood of Christ. Those who are saved by Christ. Gifted. Life by Christ. And what are those gifted by life in Christ to do? Patiently endure. Four things I have for you and we'll close. My four big takeaways. I'm sure there's more, but I just want to leave you with four. Number one, God is in control. He's sovereign. His plans and purposes are coming to an end. And He has perfect timing. I think I've told you this before. When I graduated high school, my parents gave me a watch, and on the inside they engraved it and said, you know, from love mom and dad. They said, in God's perfect timing. 
You know, they, they, they gave that to a, a boy who wasn't very patient. I remember that, and I'll always remember that. In God's perfect timing, we are called not to hustle, not to bustle, but to patiently endure. God only allows what He ordains. And He ordains some of us to suffer, to experience pain, to even experience death. And if you think you're unique in that, then you haven't read the Bible. Because there's a few guys, maybe Peter, maybe Paul, maybe Jesus Himself, that show that God even uses suffering, pain, and death for His purposes. God is in control. Number two, man is not in control. Oh, he'd like to be. But the truth is, man is a rowboat in the Pacific Ocean, tossed to and fro by sinful desires, tossed to and fro by his distorted truths, justifying our sin by calling them needs, chasing after every emotion. Can I just encourage you in a world just distraught with emotion right now? Can I, can I tell you this? Emotions are fine. In fact, God's given you emotions. But let me give you a good barometer on how to judge your emotions or how to, how to, how to give boundary, healthy boundaries to your emotions. Emotions are good. Emotions are fine as long as you feel what first aligns with biblical truth. Let me say it again. Your emotions are fine and encouraged as long as they align first and foremost with biblical truth. Therefore, the Bible says, right, what's one of the first stories? Adam. God creates Adam a wife, Eve. And he's like, whoa, man. Some of you get that on the way out. He calls her woman, right? And he is like delighted. That's a good delight. Adam should have an emotional response to that. It should be amazement. Awesome, because it's it's God's gift. Children are a blessing to the a blessing from the Lord. Our, we should delight in our children, even when they're little terrors. Man, I, I joy and ah, so great. That's a good emotion to have because it's God given. See, over and over in the Bible, He shows us what are good things to rejoice in. But when we start to distort those things, th- those things are not rejoiceable. And if you're finding your emotions in them, especially when they're in distortions of biblical truth, that emotion's going to be short-lived. And we've seen that. Look at culture. Nothing satisfies. It continues to chase after distortions because it, 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 this doesn't satisfy. So let's maybe if I unleash Pandora's box a little more, this will satisfy and this will satisfy. So it just runs after its own tail of chasing emotion. And that's why. Because God hasn't ordained those things to experience the emotions that He truly gives on good things, true things, pure things. Humanity, what we see from this book, will lament the fall of the empire. They will also lament their fallen condition and their neglect of their Savior. This is the eternal torment in the lake of fire. There will be regret and neglect for those who, do, who live in darkness. And so may we live in the light. God is in control. Man is not in control. Number three, tribulation is here and it's happening. It has been for 2,000 years. The early church experienced, the historical church experienced, the present church has experienced it now, and the future church will experience it. Each iteration of the church has been called to be patient and faithfully endure. Not escape, not bunker down, not hide, not capitulate, not not trying to take charge and usher in the kingdom in our own power, we are called to faithfully, patiently endure. Why have we not been called to do those other things? Because truth number four, Jesus is coming. If your life is centered in Jesus, then you can be at rest. You don't have to go storm the capital to try to take over. Because you say, God's in control, and maybe he wants Papa Biden in for some reason, just like he had crazy Uncle Trump in for some reason. Again, I'm an equal opportunist offender, so no matter what your political party, it'll always suck. All right. (laughs) Jesus is coming. So let me close and just say this. Live like he's coming tomorrow. You know, there's often a question 
I hear, and I'll ask it here for us today. What would you do today if you knew tomorrow you'd die? What would you do for the rest of the day today if I told you tomorrow you're going to die and you knew that I was 100% true? Isn't it interesting what thoughts begin to run through our head? And here, here's the sad truth as I reflected on this question myself. Sometimes I think the answer might reveal the reality of the depth of our faith, love, and hope in Jesus. I often will see stories, read stories about, you know, people that pancreatic cancer or something, some, something with, you have a few months to live. And it tells how they went out and, you know, tried to travel the world and do all these worldly adventures. I go, there's a life that's not rooted in Jesus. Has no hope to the future life. No hope for the future kingdom. It's trying to suck every last morsel of pleasure out of the kingdom of this earth. So I just ask you, if you die tomorrow, does what you do today have anything to do with Jesus? And if it doesn't, maybe we have some work still to do. Father God, I pray that you'd help us. First and foremost, truly see the love you have for us in giving us the book of Revelation. You give us this book not to scare us, intimidate us. You give us this book to reveal your love, your care, and your control over everything. The chaos in this book doesn't happen without your say-so. The persecution and the suffering doesn't happen without your allowance. And so may we hear the message, specifically to the messages to the seven churches, and may we patiently endure, not seeking to gain control, but resting in yours. May we admit that we are in tribulation every day generation has since the ascension of Jesus Christ. And it's different. It's different for us here in America. It's different from our, our brothers and sisters in China. And it's different from our brothers and sisters in, in all over the world in remote places and cities and rural areas, suburban areas, etc., etc. May we remember that even when we might have it good, others may have it hard. That's why we are to be the body of Christ, the family of Christ, to care for one another, to serve one another. Most of all, may we just remember, as you say in chapter 1, and you give a whole chapter to at the very end, Jesus is coming. May we live like it, not just on Sundays, but every day in every area and aspect of our lives. We can only do this by your goodness, by your grace, by your empowering spirit. So God, fill us. Convict us. Lead us. And love us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. We said...